Hello, my name is Dr. Jill Einstein, and I'm the Director of Physician Engagement for the MAVEN Project, and thank you all for joining us today. Welcome to MAVEN Project's educational session on the sports physical evaluation during COVID-19 pandemic, a pediatric cardiology perspective with Drs. Claude Roger and Gerald Angoff. After Dr. Roger completed his training at UCSF, he was hired at Kaiser Northern California. He started the regional echo lab at Kaiser San Francisco and practiced pediatric cardiology at Santa Clara and San Jose. Um, he has also um, helped with teaching at UCSF and Stanford University. He retired in 2012 and he was asked to be the medical director for school health clinics of Santa Clara County and FQHC serving the underserved population in Santa Clara County and actually one of our Maven Project clinic partners. Dr. Angoff is an assistant clinical professor of pediatrics at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center in New Hampshire and a consultant in medical information technology. At Dartmouth Hitchcock, he has a dual role in patient care and medical informatics. He specializes in pediatric and adult congenital heart disease and is co-director of the adult congenital heart program. So um, thank you both for teaching us today. And I'll, Dr. Roger, I'll have you go ahead and share your slides. Okay, let me just share here. Okay. Do you see that? Tell me when it is. Yes, that looks okay. good. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, so as Jill Einstein said, um, actually a few months ago, she forwarded a question that one of the providers at uh, one of the clinics helped by the MAVEN project asked her, uh, how will the sports physical change in the young patient with a history of COVID? Uh, and so that prompted a discussion between Dr. Angoff and, and, and me. And then uh, we kind of look into the literature a little bit and put together this talk. Um, let me see, uh, why cannot I move forward here? Uh, oh, oh, okay, there you go. Um, we don't have any um, conflict of interest here. Uh, and so let's go straight to the agenda. Uh, first, we will go over what the sports physical um, the basic what it was before the pandemic. Uh, the, and then we will discuss the cardiac complications after COVID-19 infection and COVID-19 vaccine in children. And then we will discuss uh, how um, uh, this modified the sports physical. So the, uh, there, were, there were PPE before the COVID-19, but this is for pre-participation evaluation after COVID-19 infection or vaccination in children. And then we will leave time for discussion and questions. So let's move to the first sports physical before the pandemic. Let's go over this with Dr. Um, Angoff, you are on. Uh, being on the East Coast, I can say good afternoon. Yeah, yeah, good afternoon. <laughs> uh, I'd like to provide an overview of cardiac screening of young athletes. This is a, a exclusive or before uh, uh, COVID. And, and uh, by going through uh, this overview, then we can differentiate how COVID has changed this topic. Uh, screening um, of young athletes is, is certainly widely performed. Uh, there are specific ACC, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association guidelines <laughs> relating to this, this topic. The key references I've uh, in, included in the list of references at the end, which um, by the way, will, when, <clears throat> will be available and the slides um, have active links to the articles. So with clicks, you can you can actually get to these articles um, and review them or download them. It's important to define what an athlete is. That isn't uh, necessarily set. The elements of screening uh, are historic uh, from uh, medical care in general, history, physical examination and the possibility of testing. Next, next slide, if you would, Clem. Uh, by the um, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, they have uh, a, 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 quite a specific definition who they deem to be an, a, an athlete. Um, regular competition, as others 
pricing a high premium on excellence and achievement and some form of systematic and usually intense training. So that, that really is the, the competitive athlete. Israel has really looked at screening of athletes and I'll allude to their uh, efforts along the way. They simply say individuals engaged in sport activities at any level of physical endurance from amateur sports to professional athletes. The American Heart Association and, and uh, one of the key references, uh, again, uh, annotated at the end of our presentation, um, defined 14 elements uh, from their perspective of screening for competitive athletes. There, there are other similar uh, screening protocols. I'll, I'll, I'll annotate this one. Certainly history, is is critical uh, in terms of uh, in, in sense of sy symptoms. Syncope here uh, is is pathological. I'll call it syncope to be differentiated from vasovagal syncope, uh, which I think we're familiar with the characteristics of it. Vasovagal syncope is is not considered. Uh, to be for the, the purposes of, 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 of this uh, screening, a, a concern if it occurs under typical circumstances and, um, and characteristics. Um, prior recognition of a murmur is a, really a pathological murmur rather than an innocent murmur. Um, innocent murmurs uh, notoriously common in, 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 in children uh, anywhere from 60 or 70 um, percent to to 80 percent. Uh, so hypertension, certainly um, any history of prior restriction from sports or, or concern by a physician in the past. Next slide. Family history is really a, a, a critical element. Uh, any uh, sudden death unexplained in the family, particularly at, um, at early age, ages and, and particularly in first degree relatives. <clears throat> uh, and some of the conditions that we really know predispose to, to uh, sudden death and, and exercise related events. Um, hypertrophic um, or, or dilated cardiomyopathy, long QT syndrome, um, Marfan's uh, or other specific genetic conditions, uh, one not listed here, but uh, which is gonna show up on, on some lists is, uh, is, the, is arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. If, if one has read about or been <clears throat> a party to treatment of, of, of a patient, uh, Although rare, um, it shows up in the, in the list of, of cardiac conditions inherited, which cause uh, events. With physical examination, again, a heart murmur is a pathological murmur rather than an innocent murmur or a flow murmur. Just to review, um, innocent murmurs um, or so-called stills murmurs <laughs> are vibratory or musical. They're, they're notoriously variable and present at, at sometimes absent um, at others uh, can vary with respirations and disappear typically with, with uh, standing or, or, or valsalva. And the latter is kind of important because a murmur that increases in intensity with valsalva uh, would be pathological. So and that's the differentiation there and the reason for those, uh, that little annotation. Certainly you should um, look for uh, femoral pulses, any stigmata, Marfan syndrome, any, uh, any uh, abnormal blood pressures. Yeah. Next. I mentioned that the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology um, uh, co-authored guidelines that were published in 2014. 2015, and again, they're in our references. And these are the major takeaways. First of all, that that 14 point screening or something very similar, there are, 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 are others equally uh, valid uh, with the same intent uh, should be used. Uh, screening with electrocardiograms is controversial and is done um, 
by some uh, in association with a, a comprehensive history taking a physical examination. And it can be considered, I'll talk uh, more about that along the way. And the guidelines said that universal mass screening with electrocardiograms in large populations of healthy young people was really not recommended uh, for a number of reasons, which I'll get into when I start talking about uh, problems and pitfalls. Next slide. So let's go now over um, the uh, pre-participation physical evaluation that most people doing this examination are going to follow. Um, in the US, who performs the uh, sports physicals? Well, for middle school, high school, and junior college, it's essentially um, pediatricians and family medicine physicians doing that. And of course, for large university with very uh, developed sports program, professional teams, and the national teams, they are going to be sport uh, medicine specialists doing the sports physical. So. Um, all the, the organization representing all those physicians uh, have agreed on a um, pre-participation physical evaluation. So many of you in um, primary care are going to most likely follow to that. And I would take just the one from the American Academy of Pediatrics, but again, it is the same for the American Academy of Family Physicians, and you see all the lists here. And uh, as you can see, uh, he goes over, uh, he picked up a lot from what the cardiologists uh, have, have recommended. And if you see on the history form, um, they ask questions. Have you ever passed out or nearly, nearly passed out during or after exercise? Have you ever had discomfort, pain, tightness, or pressure in your chest during exercise? Does your heart ever race, flutter in your chest, or skip beats? during exercise? Has a doctor ever told you that you have a, any health problems? Has a doctor ever requested a test of your heart? For example, ECG or an echocardiogram? Did you get lightheaded, uh, feel shorter of breath, uh, feel shorter of breath than your friends during exercise? Have you ever had a seizure? And then in the family history, they ask uh, lots of questions related to what uh, Jerry was talking. Has any family member or relative died of a heart problem or had an unexpected or unexplained sudden death? Now, here they say before age 35, but I would say, you know, uh, below age 50, the way the cardiologists recommend, it's not a bad idea um, because, you know, uh, it is um, a clue. You may want to give a lipid panel to make sure that there is not some hyper familial hyper lipidemia um, in any case. And then again, they go over the questions about the genetic health problems, such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, Marfan syndrome, and all the other ones that um, Jerry mentioned before. Um, so then uh, they said, has anyone in your family had a pacemaker or an implemented um, uh, defibrillator before age 35? And then in the physical examination form, there is the list of features found in Marfan syndrome, like kyphal scoliosis, high heart palate, pectus excavatum, arachnodactyly, hyperlaxity, myopia, mitral valve prolapse, uh, AI, uh, uh, again, and then uh, the heart murmur. So the question is, why is there so much emphasis um, uh, on the heart during the sports physical. Um, well, of course, it is in order to detect the very rare cause of sudden death during sports. Um, and there are different estimations, but here, so one of them is one per 250,000 high school athletes per year. And in the US, out of 10 million young athletes, there are about 50 deaths per year. And again, the uh, major cause of sudden death in um, uh, du during uh, sports uh, is going to be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is going to be on top here. Um, and that's an autosomal dominant disease. So it is familial. So that's why the family history is very important. However, it is autosomal dominant with very different degree of penetrance. So you could have 
uh, patients who are totally asymptomatic and you know they are detected just with an EKG when they go for surgery in their 60s and there's something wrong with the EKG and then the diagnosis is made. And then you have the other extreme where people die very early on because of uh, uh, an arrhythmia. Um, and then uh, uh, in between, you have people who are going to be suspected before of a murmur or you know, um, other, other findings, symptoms. The second one is coronary artery abnormalities. Uh, in young people, in the youngest people playing sports, it's mainly going to be the uh, congenital anomalies of the coronary arteries. As you get older, there will be more and more uh, atherosclerotic uh, heart disease in people with hyperlipidemia. As you can see, rupture of aorta, that's where the Marfan syndrome comes. And then there is also all the electrical abnormality. And questions come up about testing. What's the value and when to do it? Uh, in terms of um, uh, the electrocardiogram, I mentioned already that it's a controversial screening component and is widely wide use of an electrocardiogram as a screening element, as I mentioned, is not recommended by the, uh, the, the AHA ACC guideline. Uh, some of the issues, which I'll also detail shortly, relate to pediatric interpretations, um, normal variants, uh, and uh, who uh, is reviewing or interpreting or finalizing the interpretation on those EKGs. Echocardiogram study is mostly recommended and used as secondary testing. That is when some other abnormality or some other element um, such as uh, from the 14 point uh, or questionnaire screening shows up uh, suggesting that further studies needed an echocardiogram it provides a wealth of information used randomly uh, or by itself or with, without a clear indication of purpose uh, can uh, lead to quandaries. There are a lot of, it, of incidental findings on echocardiogram testing that may not be relevant. Ambulatory monitoring, so-called hold to monitoring, Again, should be done if there's some suspicion if you're actually looking for a, a, a result and not just done as screening. Exercise testing was actually done in two large trials, one in Italy and one in Israel. And in both instances, wasn't really helpful. Um, it can, can be performed as secondary testing, but again, I think you have to know what you're looking for and will make decisions based on what the results show. Uh, referral, is that needed? Certainly if screening's abnormal, it gets a consideration. An electrocardiogram, if done, if it's abnormal, this is with a good pediatric interpretation. Uh, it perhaps should be uh, considered before secondary um, testing is done. Otherwise, one might just have a bunch of test results and still not know uh, how to place them in context. If a pediatric cardiologist is available for referral, that would be that would be preferable. But pediatric cardiologists um, aren't always readily available, particularly in in rural areas. A series of pitfalls and potholes to this uh, screening process. Again, this is uh, exclusive of, of before COVID-19. First of all, as, as already mentioned by Claude, cardiac disease in young athletes is really rare. And unfortunately, the measure is rather crude. Uh, sudden cardiac death um, as, as, the, as the end point. And an, another... Um, Statistical way of looking at it, it's, it's one instance in 100,000 person years of, of, of uh, physical activity. So it, it really is a needle in the haystack. And this really uh, is, is the essence of, of, of screening for, for any entity or, or, or disease. If, if, it's, if it's rare, then your efforts are... Uh, are challenging. Screening was effective in one Italian study done actually in the Veneto area, 
uh, where they did identify uh, and prevent sudden cardiac death based on the screening study. However, in that area, there was a very high incidence of a genetic disorder that I mentioned, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Other studies elsewhere, particularly the one in, in, done in Israel, have not shown that screening decreases the incidence of, of um, athletics-related sudden cardiac death. So this is a, a lot of activity with questionable results. Uh, and the studies in the United States and in Israel have uh, really disputed or diminished the value of an electrocardiogram in reducing athlete mortality. Um, the effort is huge. Um, the number of athletes to be screened nationally on an annual basis is perhaps 10 to 12 million. So just think about the, the effort to really perform screening in a meaningful full way. Uh, we're all asked to, to, to do it, but the magnitude of the effort is, is really to be considered, particularly because there's a very low incidence of events. So it's a huge amount of activity to, to hopefully prevent just a few events. Um, uh, EKGs have false positive and false negatives in, in, in a large range. So this can lead to a, a, a lot of uh, uh, angst and, and concern when an electrocardiogram may be abnormal and the referrals and the testing that may ensue. Certainly the cost for all of this, uh, cost benefit ratios, nobody likes to talk about that when the outcome is, is sudden cardiac death. And then there's the resources um, are, uh, available. Are there those who feel comfortable with the examinations and interpreting the EKGs? You know, the logistical challenges and costs related to secondary tier testing that I mentioned, um, uh, when are these tests done? They represent a cost and, and, and logistics and concern generated on behalf of uh, patients and, 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 and families. And this last bullet point is really the takeaway from, I think, uh, uh, this whole effort to, to uh, screen athletes. Even with testing, screening cannot be expected to identify all athletes with important cardiovascular abnormalities. And there are significant false negative rates uh, which uh, are, um, are, are troublesome after all of the effort is performed. Before we go to um, um, review how the sports physical was modified with COVID-19, it's important to kind of go over what the cardiac complications after COVID-19 infections and COVID-19 vaccine in children are. And here I'm showing um, a slide um, that again goes along the line of what um, uh, Jerry was talking before. Yes, we are in a pandemic. Uh, of course, you know, as you know, it has affected the entire world uh, with more than uh, 4 million uh, deaths, and in the US, over 600,000 deaths. But when you look uh, uh, in small practices, and I'm going to take the example of the organization where I work now, uh, if you look at the first 1,651 tests that we perform for testing for SARS-CoV-2, first of all, more than half of those patients were tested, uh, were tested, were asymptomatic. They were tested because of exposure or because of requirement to play sports or to go to school or daycare. <clears throat> and um, we had 218 patients who tested positive. Now, that's actually a high positivity rate, you know, over 13%. Um, and even in that group of positive patients, um, close to one third were asymptomatic. Uh, that, you know, keep in mind, you can see the population here by age, uh, the distribution by age and the number of patients by age. 
And as you can see, of course, most of the patient tested are younger. Uh, also, in, um, dark blue is a number of asymptomatic, and in red is a number of, pos of positive, and uh, yellow, the number of asymptomatic among the positive. So you can see that, that this group here uh, is, is definitely skewed towards younger people. Um, and in that small experience, we had only three admissions to the hospital. Um, uh, uh, and only one went to the ICU, and it was a 34-year-old man with multiple underlying heart problems. The two other ones went to the hospital just to get oxygen for a few days. And, you know, one way to explain that discrepancy, if you look at the data, this is from Santa Clara County, where our clinics are, you can see that 7.1% of all the cases occur in patients 70 years of age and older, but 71.6% of all the deaths occurred in those 70 year old and older patients. Okay. Now, if you look at the patients who are most likely going to be interested in a sports physical less than 40 years of age, the uh, mortality in that age group was only 2.2%. Okay. So again, um, age is a big risk factor, as you know, for COVID-19. So most young individuals participating in sports and getting infected with SARS-CoV-2 will have a benign disease, about one third with no symptoms. Very few require hospitalization. There are data actually na na uh, nationally about how many patients were admitted for um, the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children that Jerry is going to go over, uh, around 4,000. So that's a lot, but when you, this is a whole country, when you bring it down to a clinic, uh, it's going to be very rare that you see that. And the mortality uh, in that, uh, uh, population is also low. Um, this was from the CDC data. Uh, if you see, um, they were in the age between 12 and 29. Again, most of the people who are going to ask for sports physical, they were, um, I mean, it is a lot, close to 3,000 deaths. But, but again, when it is going down to one uh, clinic that you deal with, it, it is very unlikely to happen. And again, you know, this is true in children and in adults. Uh, the people who are admitted uh, and the people who have severe illness um, have usually underlying condition. This is data, again, from, from the CDC. It was rarely published in the CDC, but in, in JAMA. And you can see that, you know, if a type 1 diabetes, cardiac and circulatory congenital anomalies, epilepsies, Obesity. Now, we all see loss of children with obesity, but the other conditions, they are going to be connected to a tertiary center. So, you know, if they are getting sick, they probably are going to go there, I would imagine. Um, we are not aware in our organization of people who have gone, you know, without us knowing it, but probably it happens once in a while. So, now, um, this is um, a study from Italy where they took actually active competitive athletes who were infected with COVID-19. And they really put them through an incredible amount of workup. Now, what we will do routinely in the US in the first three, we may, we do the personal history, we do the clinical profile, we probably order, maybe order some blood tests, like maybe a troponin, we may be getting an EKG, but we won't go routinely to the other one, halter, echocardiogram, and exercise testing. So they did that, and really, they found on echocardiogram, three patients who had a mild, you know, pericardial effusion. And then in one of them, on the exercise testing, there were some unusual ventricular arrhythmia. So they put th those patients through um, a cardiac MRI and one of them had some um, increased, um, you know, uh, 
abnormality of the myocardium, very mild. All those three patients recover very quickly and had a, a benign disease. So, you know, maybe the heart is getting more involved than, than we think at first, but, you know, um, um, it is still rare, okay? So what are the, let's go over what are the rare complications from COVID-19 in athletes so we know how to recommend when it is safe to return to play. That's the idea. Even those of people had very mild myopericarditis or pericarditis, it is still not a good idea to play sports when it is active. So it is good to be aware of it. So what are the complications from COVID-19 in athletes? There's a lot referenced on this slide and each main bullet point uh, could be a talk in and of itself, but I'm gonna just review in as concise manner as I, as, as I can the ways that COVID affects the heart. And it's important to kind of differentiate three ways, three scenarios for heart disease from 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 COVID uh, in uh, in uh, looking forward and in taking in, in, into account what one's uh, evaluating a patient is uh, is to what one might say or, or or recommend. There's the organ damage that occurs with the acute illness, and these are people who typically are hospitalized and 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 quite ill. Uh, and the heart can be affected along with other organs. And in the acute situation, the organ injury is a combination likely of viral injury, direct viral injury, the immune response uh, that, uh, that uh, much has been um, uh, written about and microvascular dysfunction or, or uh, injury from this is a lot of a of clotting diathesis that occurs. The immune response is this the cytokine cas cascade um, that uh, can be part of the deterioration that's seen in hospitalized patients. There's also an incidence of myocarditis and pericarditis that follows the vaccination itself. This is not a viral effect, but it's, it's, it's a syndrome that occurs after vaccination. And we need to get a lot more information about this, the, the, the stories evolving. More likely males, uh, 16 years or older, and it typically occurs several days after vaccination, more likely after the second dose. Recovery appears quick and full, and it's related in some way to, to um, the immune response. It's, it's kind of reminiscent of, of a common phenomenon uh, um, that often is seen at the, at the end of the summer uh, uh, following Coxsackie virus uh, in infections um, where one can see in young people um, pericarditis. Um, but the important part is that recovery so far appears to be uh, quick and full. There's another uh, element that's related to COVID. It's, it's called multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. There's still a lot more to be understood about that. It's been abbreviated as MIS-C. And it's in many ways is similar to Kawasaki's disease. And it, and it was a while before it being clearly differentiated. <laughs> There's a, a reference to uh, that, uh, that um, we provided um, that uh, uh, links up to uh, a, a description in, um, in the um, website of Children's Hospital in Boston. And uh, they've also published um, uh, their experience as have, uh, have others. A delayed immune response is also likely. Uh, often the, the uh, infection with COVID is indolent and found only on testing. So far, it seems that most recover quickly. And so far, the recommendation is just to clinically follow these, these patients. And I, I think, uh, the long-term impact or 
or sequelae that may follow, um, I, I think is, um, is yet to be fully defined. Uh, what this syndrome consists of is, is the, the skin rash and the erythema that's similar to Kawasaki's. In terms of the heart, it can have ventricular dysfunction, coronary dilatation, or aneurysms. There are GI symptoms. There can be respiratory uh, impairment um, and um, a headache or even, even seizures. But as sick as these kids may be appear, they seem to recover. Again, there are references um, uh, available that will that address um, each of these major components of COVID-related heart disease. Well, I don't know if some of you were uh, at uh, Dr. Gold's um, uh, conference yesterday. Uh, as you know, she does regular um, updates on COVID-19. She actually uh, made an in interesting uh, reference, and I, I haven't found the article, but it is apparently from the Cleveland Clinic. They look at all the data uh, from um, big institutions in the US, and they found that um, myocarditis from after the COVID vaccine is 76.5 per million case, okay? If you look at the number of myocarditis following the infection, it is actually more than 10 times that rate. It is 876 million per positive cases. Okay, so um, it is still a rare complication, but I think we need to be aware of it. And there is an excellent reference here that um, um, I put the graph, but you know you will find the reference in it was published last month uh, about um, myocarditis in in children. Um, so um, we suspect that when there is a viral prodrome, okay, so um, if the child is symptomatic from COVID or, or is positive, that was qualified. Now the recent signs and symptoms of congestive heart failure, of course, if it is severe congestive heart failure, that patient will go straight to the hospital. But you know, they may just be fatigued, they may have shortness of breath. All these could be early signs of congestive heart failure. Chest pain is definitely a red flag. Uh, chest pain is uh, and and then when you listen to the child, a pericardial rub, also there will be a red flag. Of course, as Jerry mentioned. Probably when we have that history and any other symptoms, we will get an EKG. And if it is an abnormal EKG, that will be also suspicious. Um, one thing we may want to get on, on those patients is also troponin. And so if this is elevated, then you will have all the um, elements to suggest that there is maybe a myocarditis. And if we find this, we need to refer to a cardiologist to do uh, an echocardiogram. Probably you will find a little uh, pericarditis as well and look at the ventricular function. And really the, the, the test uh, to really confirm is to do a, a, a cardiac magnetic resonance uh, imaging study and to prove it. And you would do that only, uh, of course, with a very, very severe case of uh, myocarditis, you wouldn't do that in the bad case because they apparently recover well uh, is the endomyocardial uh, biopsy. But it's good to be aware of that because that really um, will affect the way we um, um, advise people when it is safe to return to sports. So this is what we are going to go over now, uh, knowing what we have discussed uh, uh, from COVID-19, how are we going to modify the sports physical? Now, I was uh, curious about that and I uh, went to the American Academy uh, of Pediatric website and they said, why don't you check with your, um, the National Federation of State High School Association and look at your state and see what they recommend. And so I went to the California Interscholastic Federation a website and this is what they recommend which actually uh, is pretty good um, um, you know uh, practical so essentially um, if people are less than 18 years of age and had COVID-19 in the last three months 
if they are asymptomatic, if they were asymptomatic all, all along, which in our small study was almost one third of them, um, you know, they, they just require the normal sports physical and and then begin the gradual return to play. And, and we'll go over that. Uh, one point here I'm going to repeat for sure, a minimum of two weeks after someone is diagnosed with COVID-19, no sports at all and no physical activity except for the routine, you know, routine day, everyday life uh, activity that you need to do. Um, now, if it is symptomatic, either mild or moderate, this is when you need to be a little more careful, okay? You need more uh, uh, to go in more depth and, and try to find out what's going on. And so what I recommend is to get an EKG and, and that's what I would recommend to stop with EKG and troponin because echocardiogram means, you know, you have to refer them out um, usually. Um, so, and here is a list of the, the symptoms that will make you worry that you need to go that way. Fever for more than three days, of course, cardiopulmonary symptoms, of course, hypoxia, you know, uh, oxygen saturation at less than 95, and prolonged symptoms other than loss of taste or smell uh, or dry cough. Now, the severe illness, we will not talk about it because these patients are going to go to a tertiary care center. And I would say, if you have a patient who have gone through that, I would ask the cardiologist in that tertiary center to make the recommendation about gradual return to sports because you need more than the physical exam and the EKG that you have available in your clinic. Uh, now, if it is more than three months ago, uh, if it is severe illness, you, you go back to the same thing that we just discussed, but if it was asymptomatic then um, or mild, uh, then you can just do a routine sports physical. And some people may like both algorithm um, and I put a few here. This is from the study that um, uh, the Italian study where they look at competitive athletes. And again, I would say you reinforce that um, uh, in the US for patients with my COVID-19 infection, it is reasonable to use the pre-participation physical evaluation that we discussed and add uh, a 12 lead EKG and a troponin test. People who have any symptoms, you know, after COVID-19 and are less than uh, three months since they were got infected. And then any suspicious finding will be referred to a cardiologist for further recommendation. And this is another um, um, algorithm. And again, it stress that uh, even if there is no symptoms, absolutely no intense or competitive exercise for two weeks after someone is diagnosed with that. Um, and um, again, you will see all those references. Now, gradual return to play after COVID-19. Again, um, I'm not going to go in over, over the details, but you have to be careful and monitor the patients as they go in different stages. Monitor, allowing them to participate in sports that uh, gives an increase in heart rate, uh, you know, um, at first, less than 70% of the baseline, then less than 80%, less than 90%, and so forth and so on. This is uh, actually from up to date. So if you go to up to date and look for that, you would find that table, and that could be useful in, in the very few patients and uh, that, that will, um, you know, you want to, to assure it is safe for them to return to sports. Uh, and, here are the list of references if you want to explain that, uh, Jerry, a little bit again, uh, explain to people that uh, they can use that. We've abstracted um, references that I think support uh, the comments that we've made uh, in setting up these slides. Uh, they're uh, each uh, has um, is, is an active link to uh, the articles online. So we wanted to be sure that if um, if you did want to delve into any of the aspects of this talk that you, you'd be able to get to the references uh, pretty readily. Um, uh, the, the talk, the presentation should, should be available for 
for access or download, you should be able to hover over these uh, these individual references and click on them uh, and uh, and get a, a good idea of the complexity of of this topic. Uh, uh, again, uh, a, a lot of this, in retrospect, I'm sure will be preliminary as the data get collected and um, more analysis is done, uh, there, there, uh, there likely will be modifications of, of a lot of uh, what we've, uh, we've presented. In, in that case, it uh, would be um, a work in progress. And also, of course, um, um, Dr. Hengoff and I are available uh, for questions. So if you, you know, um, I mean, we are going to have a, um, a questions discussion, a question now. But if if ever you are faced with a patient and you are not sure exactly where to go next, feel free to uh, um, always reach uh, one of us, and we'll be glad to go over the case with you. <clears throat> so let's see how does that work. Now? Um, are people going to? Um... Okay. So, Dr. Rogin, oh, um, yeah. if you could please um, stop the share of your screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And thank you both so much for that excellent presentation and for also putting that together um, as a new talk for us. Um, I encourage our listeners to post any questions that you have. They can be general questions or if you have case specific questions, mm -hmm. um, you can put them in the chat box or um, unmute yourselves. Um, and I'd also be interested in hearing just any barriers that you face um, in the clinics um, in assessing um, your young patients. So I'm gonna first start off with uh, the following questions. Is the treatment approach to MIS-C the same as for Kawasaki's as in the IVIG and um, ASA? Aspirin. I could comment on that. Ex excellent question. The answer is yes. Um, that's a recommendation that uh, from definitely from Children's Hospital that um, that um, that uh, IV um, gamma globulin uh, be given as for Kawasaki's. Uh, I don't think anybody knows the degree to which it actually has any impact. Um, it's it's definitely effective in Kawasaki's. And that effectiveness was established at Children's Hospital, so they certainly have predisposition to it. Also, I think uh, this got started when because uh, when the, these Miss C patients first started presenting, they were thought to be Kawasaki's until the relationship to COVID was um, was found. Um, the next question, in terms of of, of following patients uh, with COVID who may have had uh, uh, cardiac. Uh, involvement uh, from any of the scenarios. Uh, I think echocardiography, because of its relatively low cost and, and, and ready availability is an excellent way to, to evaluate and follow up from any of these conditions that we've, um, that we've um, found. Uh, if someone has really been ill, if, if, if they've been uh, hospitalized, uh, with, with COVID, then they're probably going to have other specialists in, involved in things uh, like uh, like uh, CMR, magnetic resonance. Um, I, think, I think that that would probably be a down the road uh, tertiary specialty type of uh, follow-up evaluation. Thank you. Um, for any of our listeners that are working in safety net clinics, I would be interested in your access to you know, getting your patient's echocardiograms. I'm assuming that you have EKG in, you know, in your office. Um, and, you know, what is your comfort in, in reading the EKGs? Just any, any descriptions, we'd love to hear what you're facing. And you can feel free to uh, write in the, in the chat or unmute yourself. Yeah, hearing uh, Yakima here, let me throw on my video. So you can actually see me, although I'm still masked because I'm in a group setting. Um, but uh, here in Yakima, it's a little interesting. So yes, we have uh, an EKG we can do in clinic as needed. Uh, we can get troponins. Uh, the turnaround isn't super quick, but it's reasonable. Um, but in order to get an echo in the pediatric population, we're typically going to be sending them to Seattle, which is about two and a half hours away. It can be quite challenging uh, transportation-wise for our patient population. 
um, but we do it. And it usually requires a referral to pediatric cardiology, um, which then becomes accepted by Seattle Children's and then they establish an appointment time and then they get over there and it usually takes like a month or two, oh. um, which is a bummer with sports because it delays care, but it seems quite reasonable based on the potential for harm if we don't do that. Um, but do you have any specific recommendations for being in this kind of a setting? Uh, would that change anything um, in terms of how we do the workup? You know, um, safety first, I would say. So if you have any of those red flags, um, first of all, I would, tell, I would tell people after COVID-19, you know, even if they're not symptomatic, take it easy for a few weeks. And then the key is to keep an eye on them. So you, you, you call them once in a while. And, um, you know, you can use that gradual return to play. Um, it's, it's kind of practical. And then you make sure that they go along fine. Um, and if there is any red flag, yeah, you bring them in, you do a, a physical exam, you do an EKG, you do a troponin. If there is anything unusual, I will refer them and tell them, don't do sports until you see the cardiologist. Because, you know, you, what you have may not be very serious and you will recover, but it's probably not safe to play sports. Because if you have even a mild myocarditis, you could get... And a, a very nasty ventricular arrhythmia with exercise and have a cardiac arrest. So, you know, I will go on the safe side. So, you know, do the best you can on your, at your level to use, you know, your clinical skills, physical exam, history, and then get an EKG, maybe your troponin, anything suspicious, I will send them to Seattle to be evaluated. You know, ne not take a chance. Uh, I'll, I'll add perhaps um, uh, an, another slightly variable perspective, um, having practiced in some circumstances where the only thing I had was a stethoscope uh, and maybe uh, some echoes, um, it, it, that all of the recommendations really so far are, are, are based on consensus rather and very little is based on, on, on data. These are really recommendations of, of smart people getting together and doing their best. <laughs> um, it's clear that there's a huge amount of, of asymptomatic infection, <laughs> that there are uh, many um, who, who feel well by the time that you see them. And I, I think there's going to be a lot of clinical assessment and good judgment that's, that's, that's going to be involved. And I would suggest that we continue to, to watch for the recommendations <laughs> that a lot of the complications from, from COVID that we're talking about are, are rare. Uh, um, and that there's that, still that needle in the haystack um, those, uh, those things that are unusual get reported first and we don't know what the denominator is. The denominator is. So I think that, that this is going to be, as I said, work in progress and that I think we will get some uh, help along the way that, that will, will show that even if there are abnormalities that are seeing the acute situation. Right. Um, I just wanted to, to jump in here just before people get off. Um, is just to remind everybody that um, Dr. Roger and Dr. Angoff are available for any of your questions, um, if, uh, for, for any of your case questions. And I know that some of you were saying that um, even though you may have a pediatric cardiologist that's available to read your EKGs, sometimes it, there's a, sh um, a longer turnaround time. So a suggestion that I have is you can log on to the te our telehealth platform and you come to the um, main page here, you can select pediatric cardiology and you can actually upload your EKGs and send them uh, to Dr. Angoff and Dr. Roger. And um, if it's possible for you to remove um, any of the personal health information, um, that's great. And so you can um, see here, you can click on Dr. Angoff's name and then you can click submit an e-consult. And then you just put a brief description of your patient here 
and then you can actually upload your EKG. So even if you take a, like a photo of it on your phone or there's you know a, a, um, a screenshot um, from your from your EMR and then submit it and they'll um, get back to you within two business days, which may be a shorter turnaround time than what you're seeing in your clinic. Um, so that's fine to you know just to get like an like an overread from them. Um, and we also have that for um, adult cardiology as well. Uh, so I just wanted to let you know that they're happy to answer um, any questions about that. And, and if you have any questions right now, just about the telehealth platform. Looks like we're freezing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let me... I think it's just GL. Uh, she says, yeah, yeah, yeah. There we are. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, so, okay. but I just wanted to point that out to, to, to the providers that please utilize our docs. They're here for you. Sometimes they even get back to you in less than a day, you know, for the e-consults. Cert certainly, that would be a great way, as, as I'm sure Claude and I are going to be uh, monitoring um, as the, the literature as it evolves, as more data comes in, as we find out more about the denominators and long-term follow-up. Yeah. yeah. That's great. The, the message, though, is that in, in primary care clinics, you are not going to see very, I mean, you, you know, we had uh, over 200, I mean, 220 positive cases. We haven't seen any yet. So, I mean, it's going to happen. I mean, there, there have been cases, of course, there have been deaths uh, in the country, but it is rare at, at, at the clinic level, you know, that you will find that. Now, you know, if you talk to the people at Boston Children's Hospital, you know, they probably have a few hundreds themselves that they have seen, of course, you know, there is a, it's a different perspective. Um, so um, I think the, the key is to be aware of it uh, and, you know, do the best you can. And again, um, some of this algorithm can be helpful. Like, you know, if it is um, asymptomatic, that was more than three months, I mean, I wouldn't worry, you know, I, I would treat it normally. But anyone else that's a little closer, uh, has anything suspicious, you know, I would be more cautious. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, let me know, are there any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourselves. Um, and uh, Nicole, I'll definitely follow up with you um, about your question there. That's great um, as well. And then um, about the slides, good question. So um, just later today, I'll be emailing all of you um, with the slides, so you'll have them for your reference. And then a recording of this talk is, will be available within two weeks on our Maven Project website. So if you go to the uh, homepage, go to the upper right-hand corner, and it says recorded sessions, and it takes you to our Maven Project YouTube channel um, with recordings of all of our sessions. And then you'll also be receiving um, a follow-up email that will have the link to the CME um, survey, which is just a brief survey. Um, and you'll fill that out um, as well. So really great to see everybody. A huge thank you um, to Dr. Roger and Dr. Anga for your presentation today. Thank you to all of our primary care provider Maven Project partners. Um, we value what you do for your patients. They're very lucky to have you and we're here to support you in any ways that we can. So um, please reach out to our doctors. They're definitely eager and um, ready to help you all.